Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dean Sherzai. I'm uh, half of a team, my wife and I. Uh, you got the lesser half today. That's OK. <laughs> I'll try to accommodate. And um, so my wife actually is on her way back from New York uh, right as we speak. So we're, uh, our area of research is the brain. Our journey started with our grandparents, both mine and my wife's. Um, my grandfather was one of the brightest people I've ever known or will know. My uncles were, are mostly surgeons, and most surgeons think they're hunters. So we, and thank goodness for the animals, they're terrible hunters. And we had a 180 or so acre farm in uh, Virginia. Uh, near Charlottesville, and we used to go there on a regular basis, and uh, my grandfather would be at the center, and everybody would be around him, 30, 40 children and grandchildren, everybody. And he would be playing chess with people and everything, and um, one of those times, this is early 80s, we remember him sitting on one side and everybody on the other trying to beat him, and he was moving the knight and when he tried to move the knight, and for those who, of you who play chess, they know that knight, moving the knight is a little, you know, it's an L shape. He forgot how to move the knight, and everybody was taken aback. I mean, this was a cataclysmic event in a family where cognition is everything, you know. And for the foundation of the family, the, the cornerstone of the family to lose part of his memory, was was terrible and we saw this gradual decline of this you know incredible human being in small increments just one step at a time until he finally uh, died of the complications related to alzheimer's and so <clears throat> moving forward many years later after medical school georgetown nih for research and many other endeavors we i ended up being a neurologist and I met my wife 15 years ago, and we, our first conversation was about, about our grandparents. Her grandfather, same situation, brilliant man, trained in Columbia, Hopkins, surgeon, died of Alzheimer's, actually Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So this is what brought us into this journey. And 15 years ago, we started by talking about um, molecular research you know, the clinical trials. In fact, we ended up doing research in the number one re research place at the time, and UCSD, with Dr. Leon Thal. And it was the same clinical trial after clinical trial, and failure after failure after failure. Around that time, we decided to take the road less traveled. And we looked around and said, is there another model that we can follow? And for heart disease, for cancer, for diabetes, for longevity, the one place that kept coming back was Loma Linda. Not Loma Linda in particular, the Seventh-day Adventist. So we decided to move to Loma Linda. I called Dr. Hart. I knew him from another life. Uh, I, I did a stent with uh, Tommy Thompson, and Secretary of Health and Human Services in Afghanistan for a few years, created the healthcare system there on my off time. We came back, and we, I knew Dr. Hart. I said, we want to come here and do work. So we started our Brain Health Institute there, our center, and started seeing patients. Um, and it was an amazing journey that we started. And so our entire life has been towards prevention. In fact, we were the only neurologist that, that was dedicated to prevention from the very beginning. In fact, Aisha did her preventive medicine residency as well as neurology residency at Loma Linda and then did a fellowship in stroke and vascular disease at Columbia University. And the decision to go towards lifestyle was the best thing we could have done because now, 15 years later or 10 years later, 10 to 15 years later, we know that this is the only path. And you'll see that hundreds of billions of dollars later and we still don't have a single drug to affect this devastating disease. And uh, so here we are. And then the next thing you have to know is that the most important thing you need to focus on, and this is a little selfish, how many doctors are here? Anybody, any doctors? We think that you just have to focus on your brain. And this is, this is a little selfish because if you take care of the brain, I'm just kidding, if you take care of the brain, you've taken care of the entire body. 
Now re realize this three pound organ, 2% of body's weight, consumes 25 to 30% of your body's energy at any one time. In fact, it's most active and it does its best job during sleep. So there's no rest for the brain. It does continuously works. And, and this incredible brain has 87 billion neurons, one quadrillion connections, potentially one quadrillion connections, one times 10 to the 50th processing power for the computer people here. They know that that's more than any computer, supercomputer today. But at the same time, it's overwhelmed. We were not expected to live more than 30, 40, 50 years. We were expected to run away from tigers, bears, lions, sometimes dogs, and mate, and then die. Not always in that order, but that was the basic general scheme. I have to be careful with my talk. It gets a little risky sometimes. I'm from Pittsburgh, so. <laughs> um, so it's, it, but we have thrived, and mostly because of the public health and surgery and better techniques and, uh, you know, antibiotics, and we're living 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and if you're Loma Linda, 90 and 100. And we're thriving, and that's the goal. And so, the, but the problem is this, this dilemma. But before we get that there, there are models of healthy living, you know, vibrant brain healthy living, many models. The fastest growing population in America is 80 and above. The second fastest is 60 and above. And the general expectation is that there should be a decline. And there is. That's the expectation. Decline after 40 in cognition. But that's not always the case. And that's the case we're making. And it's not just a belief system. It's actually the data shows that you can actually live a continually growing cognitive life. And we see this regularly in Loma Linda. A little side story on, 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 on that is Dr. Wareham. How many people here know about Dr. Wareham? Probably a lot of people here. He lived to 95. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon. He did open to close surgeries late into life. And then um, he retired at 95, supposedly because he wanted to travel. And, and he lived to 104 and died, I think, last year. And, and again, very active, vibrant life. So that's the idea. But we have this tsunami to deal with, dementia. Dementia is the big category. It's the umbrella category. Generally speaking, dementia is when you have cognitive decline to the extent where it's affecting your daily life. Your ability to drive, your ability to do your finances, your ability to take care of your own medications. Not just physical limitation, but cognitive limitation. That's dementia. Generally speaking, we don't need to do and go into the neuropsychological parameters, but generally. Under dementia, there are many different diseases. Biggest category is Alzheimer's, 60 to 70 percent. But there are others, such as Lewy body disease. Robin Williams uh, was diagnosed with Lewy body disease right before his demise. We have frontotemporal lobe dementia, we have vascular dementia, we have Parkinson's and dementia, and a whole slew of other metabolic and other dementias. But Alzheimer's is the biggest one. Now, it's the fastest growing epidemic in the United States and the Western world. 5.8 million people have dementia and Alzheimer's in particular in the United States. Every 64 seconds, somebody is being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In fact, that's an understatement in some populations, because in some populations, they are never brought to the doctor or given a clinical diagnosis. They're just you know, part of aging and kept at home. And it's the third leading cause of mortality and morbidity in the U.S., number one in the U.K., number one in Japan, and it's going to be number one in the U.S. as well. And if the news wasn't bad enough there, whereas we're succeeding in surviving many chronic diseases like HIV, stroke, heart disease, prostate cancer, breast cancer, mortality from Alzheimer's has grown by 145% in the last 15 years. And it's growing faster. As you can see, the curve is going to go higher and higher. <clears throat> One in 10 individuals over 65 are diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And that number doubles every 10 years until at 85, nearly 50% have Alzheimer's and a larger proportion have dementia. There are some disparities. Women are at greater risk of developing Alzheimer's. One in 
set, one in six women in their lifetime develop Alzheimer's, one in 11 men. That's actually a larger number than several of the top cancers combined. The reason, it's actually more than the survival bias. You know, women live longer, but even when you uh, put that into the formula, there's uh, other causes. Part of that is that the group that's coming to us with this disease are, were people who were in their you know, in 1920s, 30s, had lower challenge, lower cognitive challenge, and that is a big factor. But other factors such as hormonal and vascular as well, which we're studying, my wife and I. Other disparity population are African Americans and Hispanics. That number is actually much lower than reality. It says four times more than the uh, other populations. It's actually much more than that from our experience when we go give, give talks in African American churches and other communities. And it has nothing to do with race, it's access, access. Whereas real estate is location, 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 public health is access, access, access. Access to information, access to resources, access to healthcare. Hispanics, 2.7 times, it's actually even more because a lot of them don't bring the pay, their family members to the clinics. And those numbers are growing as well. The cost is astronomical. The second costly disease in America is heart disease at 120 billion. Third costliest is cancers. All of them combined, that's 60 billion. Direct cost of Alzheimer's is 290 billion, indirect cost another 240 billion. And that number is expected to go to 1.1 to 2 trillion dollars by 2050, which by itself will not only collapse the healthcare system, but our system in general. So let's talk about some myths. Myth number one, Alzheimer's cannot be prevented. This was controversial up to recently, but even in this year's Alzheimer's Association International Conference, the big statement was prevention is the new cure. And this was incredible for us because for year after year, we've been going there, we've been saying this, and many times they've actually stopped us from talking. We were invited to BBC Breakfast, the largest show in the world, and we were supposed to have 45 minutes to talk about this. They got a call from their equivalent of Alzheimer's Association telling them that it's controversial, Alzheimer's cannot be prevented. So we got 10 minutes with them. The good news was that we saw ABBA. So that was my, my. <laughs> but, but this year, last year, the, the studies showed 30% relationship. This year, 60% relationship. And, and that's with their protocols which is very soft protocol. We think that if a, you know, a comprehensive protocol is put in place, 90% of Alzheimer's can be prevented. And I'll show you, this is not a, just a hyperbole. Um, Alzheimer's starts with forgetfulness. That's not the case. Alzheimer's does not start with a clinical diagnosis. Alzheimer's started 30 years ago. Invariably, in any gathering, somebody asks me, how do I know I have Alzheimer's? Does anybody have that question? Well, you do, and all, everybody here has Alzheimer's, because Alzheimer's is not a point disease. Once you get rid of that, then it becomes something you can control, because if it's a point disease, you have nothing to do with that point, it just happens. No, it's a lifestyle disease that starts in your 20s and 30s. But who's gonna tell 20 and 30 year olds to change their lifestyle? But it is important because of maintenance of cognition. So it starts that early. And, and, and the symptoms that appear when the disease is fully manifest is just that last straw that broke the camel's back. Third is that one medicine is gonna take care of this. It's not, because it's not one disease. It's, it's multi-dimensional disease. And if there is ever a drug, it's not gonna be one drug, it's gonna be a concoction a, 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 of medications and much earlier than, than after the diagnosis has been made. The last one is Alzheimer's is a genetic disease. Everything is genetic, but the penetrance uh, or, uh, is, is important, meaning some diseases, the genes determine the disease, Huntington's disease. If the father has the gene and how many repeats of that, that protein product, you know exactly when the child will get the disease and there's nothing you can do about it. But majority of chronic diseases of aging have nothing to do with one gene. It's a polygenetic interaction with environment. And that's, that we'll show you. So what has obscured this process are two proteins. 
we like simple things. We like simple stories because it's manageable. So if it's only amyloid and tau, then all we have to do is just attack amyloid and tau. I worked at uh, NIH for two years on, on, on the experimental therapeutics branch of NIH. It doesn't get any more esoteric as that, than that. Drugs, molecules, mouse studies, uh, enzymes against amyloid, antibodies against amyloid, you name it, we did it. After all these years and hundreds of billions of dollars spent, the success rate has been 100% failure. We don't have a single drug that slows or stops the disease. The drugs that we have, which, such as Aricep, Nemenda, all of those are symptomatic drugs. Not even the companies claim that they slow or stop the disease. They just help the symptom, but the curve continues. So that, there's 100% failure. So let's talk about the genetics. So we have new tools such as GWAS, genome-wide analysis and others that have given us a great picture into genetics of different diseases, especially the more common diseases. We know what genes are involved in Alzheimer's. These are the genes. So what percentage of Alzheimer's do you think is driven by the kind of genes like in Huntington's that if you have those genes, you're going to get the disease no matter what? You're close. That's, that's fantastic. It's actually 3%, those three genes. Presenelin 1, presenelin 2, and APP. APP is in Down syndrome individuals. Individuals with Down syndrome, if they live long enough, they will all get Alzheimer's. But, but we were fortunate to get the data from my wife and I from NIH that look at Down syndrome individuals. And if you affected the proxies of lifestyle, meaning things that were affected by life, such as diabetes, cholesterol, and, 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 and um, uh, high blood pressure, even this group, the, the, disease, the disease was pushed back. So even in that population, but presenelin 1 and presenelin 2, which together is about 2%, that's a foregone. If you have the, those genes, you're going to get the disease. So what about the next higher level penetrance, meaning the genes that has higher risk? ApoE4, how many people here know about ApoE4? Okay, so ApoE4 is a gene that if you have one from one parent, one copy, your risk goes up four times. If you have one from each parent, your risk goes up 12 to 15 times. <clears throat> so that means if you have two genes, one from each parent, you're going to get Alzheimer's, right? Wrong. 50% of people with both genes never get Alzheimer's. And that's without the knowledge of involvement of a comprehensive lifestyle. Imagine if you do something about it. And other studies from Nigeria, where individuals from Nigeria who had ApoE4 at a higher rate, in Nigeria they had, this is before acculturation and McDonald's and, uh, and all these uh, restaurants going there, their rate of Alzheimer's was actually much lower. The same population in US, same genetic group, their risk was much higher. What was the difference? Lifestyle. What about these other genes? These are genes that have to do with your body's response to inflammation your body's response to energy utilization, your body's response to waste elimination. So if you have bad genes, for uh, ApoE4 is a lipid transporter, fat transporter. So if it's not doing its job well, the ApoE4 type, then that means that if you have a lot of fat in your body, a lot of fat in your diet, it's not going to do a good job. That's going to damage the brain. The, the good variety, ApoE2, actually gives you a lot of protection. And how it does that by lipid transport. So the joke, Henny Youngman, I'm going to age myself. Doctor, it hurts when I do this. Therefore, don't do that. Doctor, I'm damaging my brain when I have lipids. Therefore, don't have fat. Literally, it sounds simplistic, but it's not. It's that inflammation. If you have the kind of genes that are not as responsive to inflammation or does not respond properly or overreacts. So if you have a lot of inflammation, what happens? Your body's not responding, the inflammatory byproducts go into the cells and damage the cells. So what causes inflammation? Well, infections and injuries, yes. But what's the common inf uh, item in inflammation that you experience three times a day? Food. Food, by far the most. What about the other ones? So energy utilization, glucose utilization. What affects that? Food. What about 
waste, waste disposal, getting rid of waste from cells. So don't create a lot of waste because the cell is not able to get rid of it. Then it accumulates in these things called brown bodies within cells and then destroys the transportation and communication within cells. So these genes are not Alzheimer's genes. They are lifestyle response genes. There it is, 95%. In our book, we said 90%. It was such a hoopla that we said, we never said we'd reverse Alzheimer's. There are people that have written books that are making those claims on 10 patients or this or that. That's irresponsible. They're not even good scientists. Um, we say that you can slow the, if somebody has dementia, you can slow it down. But even prior to dementia, MCI level, mild cognitive impairment level, you can actually reverse the direction. That's good enough. We're talking about millions of people that can be reversed. If we can move the disease back five years, the cost of Alzheimer's will have been reduced by half. That's, that's a remarkable thing. So the statement in the Alzheimer's Association this year was prevention is the new cure or the new treatment. And the big paper that they quoted Alzheimer's meeting lifestyle factors are the best and only bet now for reducing dementia risk. And in this uh, paper, genetic risk, lifestyle, and dementia, can, can dementia risk due to genes be countered by adherence to a healthy lifestyle? Well, risk of incident dementia, 50% higher among participants of a high genetic risk group. So if you had certain genes, your risk was 50% higher. But participants with a higher genetic risk on a good lifestyle they reduce their risk by one third, more than three times. So adherence to a healthy lifestyle can have offset even genetic risk factors. This we've been talking about over and over again in our reviews that we've done, and then in Alzheimer's Association uh, conference, they actually reiterated that in, in a new paper. Impact of healthy lifestyle factors on the risk of Alzheimer's dementia Findings from the two prospective cohort studies, two large studies that were combined. To what extent does combination of lifestyle factors reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease? This is a big study. They looked at over 9.1 years, they looked at five factors. Not smoking, more than 150 minutes of vig moderate to vigorous exercise, minimal alcohol um, usage, and um, high quality mind diet, and engagement in cognitive activity. Mind diet is a combination of Mediterranean diet and a DASH diet. DASH diet is a blood pressure diet which is mostly plant-based and low salt. Uh, Mediterranean diet, in a second, you'll actually see a Mediterranean diet in a completely different way because my wife did the largest study in the country looking at what aspect of Mediterranean diet people keep talking about. Here's a clue. It's not the violin, it's not the wine, and it's not the cheese. So, <laughs> so you got a score of zero to five, depending on adherence. So those who adhere to just one of them were going to get the disease, the genetics determined the outcome. Those that adhere to two or three of the factors, you know, smoking or low alcohol, that they reduce the risk by 40%, 39% to 40%. And those that adhere to four to five of those factors lowered the risk by 60%. This was the big talk of, of, the, of the year. Now, let's go back. What they thought was healthy living is actually not that healthy living. You know, here's our approach to lifestyle. We actually say, what's the North Star? What's the gold standard? And I agree, we will start with the end here. Um, Whole food, plant-based. If you can eliminate fats altogether, and if you're gonna get your fats from whole foods, that's great. If you can eliminate salt, and you can eliminate processed sugar, that's the optimal. But as public health person, my expectation for you is not to do that. Your step is your next step. Because if we don't create a pattern of success, all we're doing is a new year resolution. How often do they fail? Like that 100%. So the goal should be clear. Let's throw some words out. Get rid of some two of my least favorite words in English language. One is motivation, which is the most disempowering word. Usually the people that are motivated by chance, they're the ones that are pre preaching to everybody, saying, pull yourself by the bootstraps. 
Motivation means nothing. It has no denominator, no you know, parameters. Motivation, true motivation is when you create clear direction, small steps of success, and you create that success paradigm, and then the brain actually starts liking it, liking it, and it becomes behavior. That's a behavioral model of motivation. My second least favorite word is moderation. You can take small steps toward a goal. That's completely acceptable because those are small successful steps. But a broad term like moderation is basically a language people use on the way out to failing something. Oh, it's all about moderation. You know, it's not. It's about having a clear direction, small step. This lifestyle regimen that they were talking about is minimal. And with this minimal lifestyle, you can reduce the risk by 60%. Absolutely. I mean, this is the most devastating disease, and we can reduce it with, by six. And we're going to tell you how you can reduce it by 90%. So, <clears throat> preventing Alzheimer's, our most urgent healthcare priority. What are the four mechanisms of chronic disease? Oxidation, inflammation, energy dysregulation or glu glucose dysregulation, and fat dysregulation or lipid dysregulation those four processes. Different diseases, different ways in Alzheimer's. Every day somebody comes, oh, it's a type 3 diabetes. Another person says, oh, it's a garbage disposal problem. Oh, it's a, 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 you know, a fat storage. It's all of those, depending which direction you came from. We'll show you that diabetes is a risk factor. For, so for those, that's the path. For others like football players or others who've had a chronic traumatic injury, inflammation is the path. So different paths. And what affects these four processes? Nutrition, exercise, stress management, and sleep, restorative sleep. And we added a fifth one, which is mental activity and social activity, which has nothing to do with those four processes, but they, that in itself creates those connections. It's critical. So with that, we came with this self-serving acronym, NEURO, N for nutrition, E for exercise, U for unwind. We don't believe in just reducing stress. We believe in good stress and bad stress. In fact, you'll find out that good stress is the most important factor in your life. R is restorative sleep, not just sleep. You can knock people out, but if they're not getting deep level of sleep, they're not going through those cycles, you're not doing anything as far as what the purpose of sleep is. And always optimizing mental and social activity. And here's a clue. It's not Sudoku. <laughs> yes. So, nutrition. This is the standard American diet, the SAD diet. Why is this so attractive? Because your body actually was created in a way that it craves these high energy items. You are not a chronic life being. You are acute life being. You're expected, you are expected to live from tiger to tiger, mate, die. Two tigers, sometimes three tigers, who knows. Uh, but, but anything that gave you high energy, that's what you craved. So a fat has twice the energy quanta than uh, protein or carbohydrates. So that's what you crave. What about sugar? Sugar is, is, is a commodity in most countries. Most of you have traveled to other countries, I know. And when you go to certain countries, sugar is a commodity. It's, um, they have parties and events around sugar. It's tr so sugar and its high glycemic or high rise in energy is what's attractive. And that's why your body craves it. Now, it's great for immediate survival. If you're going to run away from something, you need that. Uh, I, in high school in Pittsburgh, I, I was, played a lot of sports, soccer, tennis, and I was the captain of my soccer team, and somebody told me that honey is good for, for, for playing soccer. So I bought cans of honey for all the players. <laughs> and that was a, a pretty expensive for, for, because I got my money from my paper route. So, and, and everybody had half the can before the game. And we were amazing the first 10 minutes. <laughs> we got crushed the second half. Literally, that's a metaphor for all these goofy keto, paleo, immediate gratification. I'm going to take a little digression. 
keto, ketogenic diet. It doesn't make sense in any way. Ketogenic diet came to us from seizure patients, a subset of seizure patients, a subset of pediatric seizure patients, a subset of pediatric seizure patients that were not controlled with four anti-epileptics. So you gave them a ketogenic diet. And how did it control that? By acidifying the brain and dulling it down. So let's say that works. It's like saying because chemotherapy works for cancer, everybody should get chemotherapy. That's ridiculous. It's like saying because chemotherapy helps you lose weight. Because that's the only thing so far it's been shown to be effective in. Nothing more than six months in any of the chronic diseases. We did the review. Nothing. So it's critical that there's a lot of noise. And you can see I'm passionate about all this noise that's coming out. In fact, even this week, uh, this one journal in any case, let's get back to the story. So this is the problem. But it's a big problem because it's, it's, it's high energy. People crave it. There's a reason why 70% of foods that are packaged have sugar in them. Even when you don't think they need sugar. Why? Because sugar is addictive. So this, is, this should be the center piece of your diet. Even, even if you're having meat here and there, I'd rather you don't. But, but remember, steps towards ultimate goal. This should be the centerpiece. And when it comes to this, actually nobody disagrees. Even the keto, paleo, all of these. So more fiber, more fruits, vegetables. The only thing that they argue about is carbs from processed and all that. But this should be the centerpiece. And why? Because the brain is the most vascular organ in the body. As much as you think the heart, the kidney, other organs, the brain has 400 miles of vasculature. In fact, there is a picture, which I, I forgot to put in here, if you denude the brain of all the neuronal tissue, all, and you see all the vessels that are left, you, you wonder, where, is the, you know, if, where do the neurons fit? Because it's all vascular. So if you're going to get fat to the brain, some people say brain is made of fat, therefore you need fat, ridiculous. Even if you get fat to the neurons, it has to go through those vasculature, and the endothelium is damaged immediately. The vessels are damaged immediately. So that's why we have to look at this as, as, as a vascular disease in many ways. So the dietary fat composition and dementia risk study, uh, cholesterol plays a central role in uh, Alzheimer's disease pathology. Midlife high blood cholesterol increases risk of late life Alzheimer's, increased risk of Alzheimer's with higher consumption of saturated fat and trans fats, and mono and polyunsaturated fats were healthy. This was the final conclusion from a major study that we, did, we just cited. Um, the Alzheimer's gene cholesterol and blood pressure study, 1,449 participants, age 65 to 79. Those with APOE4 had twice the risk, but those with poor diet, above that twi two times risk, increased their risk three times more. So diet actually perpetuated and increased that risk significantly more. The Chicago Health Study, 2,500 individuals, higher amounts of saturated fat and trans, trans fats over six years, higher risk of developing Alzheimer's, while those who ate fats derived from plants had a much lower risk. The Adventist Health Study, in front of ours, Paul Guillem and Loma Linda. In 1993, the study was done. Now, this is before President Reagan announced that he had Alzheimer's, which means there were a lot of people who were not getting diagnosed, which means that whatever statistics we have is skewed away from Alzheimer's. And even then, he found that individuals who ate meat, fish even, fish, chicken, and, and, and meat, had twice as high, a greater risk of developing Alzheimer's. The Kaiser Permanente study, 9,900 individuals, high cholesterol, increased your risk by 57%, and even moderate or borderline cholesterol increased your risk by 23%. Women's health study, nearly 6,000 women followed over four years. Higher saturated fat intake was associated with a poor trajectory of cognition, Special, specifically faster decline in memory by 
and women with the lowest saturated fat intake had the brain function of women six years longer, uh, younger by imaging and by neuropsychological testing. Six years. Uh, the research, my wife did her work at Columbia University. Again, same thing. Participants who ate a plant-based diet had a lower risk of cognitive decline over a span of six years. Large study. The Rush University Memory and Aging Project, 1,000 patients, ages 58 to 98, strict adherence to MIND diet, reduced 53% reduction in risk of Alzheimer's. 53%. Do you have a drug that reduces Alzheimer's risk by 1%? No, 53%. And even moderate adherence reduced your risk by 35%. And that's controlling for all the other factors as well. Again, younger brain, bigger brain. Adventist Health Study, we did the study in, in a subgroup of Adventist Health Study, the religious order, 500 individuals looking at their diet. Again, those who were plant-based had a significantly lower risk of cognitive, lower risk of cognitive decline. Then was the, the next group was pescatarians, and the next group were the omnivores. My wife did the largest study in the country, that, uh, the California Teacher Study. She won the American Heart Association Youngest Researcher Award for this. Initially, <clears throat> when she went to um, Columbia, she said she wants to work on epidemiology and lifestyle. They said it's a career suicide. Um, well, it turned out differently. Uh, 133,000 people looking at diet, specifically Mediterranean diet and different levels of adherence to Mediterranean diet. And I'll explain to you what that is. And if you are fully adherent to Mediterranean, the highest form of good Mediterranean diet, your risk of stroke was lowered by 44%. Now, this is a disease that a person has a stroke. They either have a hemiparesis, one side is paralyzed, or facial paralysis, or language. You go to the emergency room, CT scan at $1,000. CTA, another uh, $2,000. MRI, another $3,000. Emergency room stay, ICU combined, $20,000 to $40,000. And then you go home with an aspirin and a lipid-lowering drug. That's it. That's it. And this shows 44% reduction. Why isn't this on, top of, you know, on the cover of Time magazine? And so then you look at what is Mediterranean diet, not just in this study, but in any study. They give high score in the Mediterranean studies throughout the country. They give high scores for vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, high ratio of polyunsaturated fats and saturated fats, and low scores for meat, poultry, and dairy. What does this look like? Whole food, plant-based. Why aren't they saying that? Because Mediterranean, I know I'm in the church, it's sexy. Whole food, plant-based just doesn't come out well from your mouth, yeah. <laughs> Mediterranean, they think about gondolas and violin and no, nothing to do with that. It's this right there. Every study that you hear, every mind study, every Mediterranean study, everything, it's this. So, and, and the good news is every step that you took towards this Mediterranean diet reduced your risk. So it's not an all or none phenomenon. Every step was a positive step because to us as public health, and not just neurologists, but public health people, it's critical that we empower people, knowing that start with one step. It's critical to start that with one, that one step. What about vitamins? So two years ago when we wrote the book, we were a little more pushy with vitamins. One of our favorite, most humble phrases in English language is, and comes from science, to the best of our knowledge today, which means be open for change, you know, for the data is going to change. But that doesn't mean there's something weak in the science. That's the whole point. But the, so the knowledge we have now is useful. So two years ago, we were a little more omega, B12, and vitamin D, and, you know, and turmeric. Now we're pushing, pulling back a little, not completely. To be honest, our family is still taking some omega-3s and plant-based and, and, and B12, and definitely turmeric. You should still take turmeric. But the data shows that the uh, uh, vitamins, there's no data on vitamins, no valid, repeatable data that shows taking vitamins help, unless you are deficient. So check, if you're vitamin D deficient, first of all, find out what, what is missing in your lifestyle. Are you getting enough sun? 
are using too much, you know, uh, uh, or, or are you not getting it from your food? So that's the first step. And then maybe supplementation. Because data show that when you take vitamins or you take it unnecessarily, actually in certain cases you increase your risk of cancer. So take vitamins only when needed. Uh, some of the vitamins that are slightly harmless are the omegas and the BB vitamins are water soluble, but others like A, D, E, K can become toxic. So be aware of it. So get it from food form. Turmeric, still there's data that turmeric is helpful because it's anti-inflammatory. We did the study at uh, Cedar sinai Looking at the retina through this special device, we gave people um, turmeric with pepperin. And because turmeric, actually curcumin, that part of it, binds to amyloid, this bad protein, we could see it actually removed. So uh, we think that uh, getting some of that is appropriate. Um, inflammation is the key factor here. B12, if you have high homocysteine, check your B12, check your folate, and because homocysteine has been associated with uh, brain atrophy and dementia, high homocysteine levels. Okay, so that's the vitamin trials that we were talking about. Fatty acids as well. The vitamins are most effective repeatedly in synergistic form. Where do you find vitamins in a synergy? In food. So next, um, the controversies. We talked, I already did my um, little rant on ketogenic diet. Choline is the new thing that they're bringing up. And, you, and this is an interesting time. It's kind of fun because there's resistance from the meat industry and all of this. So a lot of what we call mercenary statisticians are out there doing meta-analysis and there's a book called lies something lies fill that in and then statistics so people can make play with statistics any way they they want to by putting in variables and not putting in variables to come out with outcomes all of a sudden this one uh, um, researcher that works actually for the meat industry came up with a opinion paper in, in British Journal of Medicine saying that coal, there's a choline de emergency in the country Opinion paper, based on nothing, and there is no choline emergency. Okay, that's that's off your table. Um, and and the today, actually yesterday, uh, the Ameri uh, sorry, um, Annals of Internal Medicine published a paper by this one group funded by you know who, that said that oh we did the statistics, and after we did our own statistics, we didn't see any difference, so we can go back to eating meat. There is no grounds to that. In fact, we, uh, Dr. Dr. Katz, myself, and others are actually doing the work to, to, to talk to the other authorities. In fact, WHO um, and all uh, Harvard and uh, Mayo and all of these uh, uh, nutritional uh, uh, programs have come resisting, saying that th this is based on nothing. You're going to hear this. The data that we just presented on nutrition was a fraction of all the data that shows that plant-based uh, lifestyle is protective for brain and all chronic diseases. So, oh, and this is a research paper we did nationwide, NIS, 8 million people per, per, per year that showed the relation between diabetes and dementia. So those who have higher diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes have much higher risk of dementia. And this is the Enhance paper that my wife and I did, which is another nationwide database and a great data source that showed that even if you don't have diabetes, but you have insulin resistance or, you know, so pre-diabetics, your risk of cognitive decline actually increases. So watch your hemoglobin A1C, watch your sugars. And by the way, you develop insulin resistance not just by high sugar levels, mostly by high fat. So that's another thing to just be aware of. So what is the optimal diet? In fact, we think the most important part of healthcare, the centerpiece of all healthcare is nutrition. It's a whole food, plant-based diet. Eliminate meat, poultry, and dairy. Specifically, uh, so, uh, consumption of berries, greens, leafy vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. Uh, there's another book out there by a non-scientist but brilliant businessman, and I'm actually saying this so that uh, I'm challenged by it. It's uh, called Plant Paradox. How many people have read that? Have you heard about it? And based on no science, uh, that there are these things called lectins in certain foods that are poisonous. 
a, you're brilliant that when you create the disease, and at the same time that the book comes out, you have the pills that block the disease. That's, I should have been only that smart. So, so, he, so the book came out at the same time that lectin blocking pills came out. No, by the way, of the blue zones, in fact, of all the healthiest places, you know what's the common, most common denominator food? Beans. What has the highest amount of lectins of all the foods? Beans. So there is the food. Any questions? No questions? I must have done a great job. Okay. Yes. It's my, it's our paper, so I hope he didn't write the opposite. No, no. The, uh, so diabetes mellitus in the context of, uh, sorry, so where is it? Oh, so this was vascular dementia was increased. AD, there was no relationship. So that's a, that's a, yeah, there's no relationship with that. But vascular dementia, we think that vascular dementia, we think that Alzheimer's at its core is vascular dementia. Because they have found that vascular changes happen before amyloid deposition in Alzheimer's patients. With the new tools, with the new MRIs, they can actually see the microvasculature. And vascular changes happen way before amyloid deposition. Okay, so exercise. Exercise is important, extremely important, not just for brain health, but for, we did a study with Columbia University for um, um, John Hancock, the, the insurance company. We were hoping that the data that came out would be nutrition or this or that, but the one denominator that stood out for healthy aging in general not, was exercise, and, and especially legs. So you'll get, after this, everybody will be doing squats going home, so. So uh, exercise, multiple studies, we, we don't have that much time to, to, to talk too much about this, but um, um, uh, basically people who exercised had better brains, bigger brains, they had lower risk of dementia, they had lower um, risk of cognitive decline even at earlier age. So what type of exercise was found to be most effective? Three things. One is a lot more aerobic exercise than you thought. It's not just walking the neighborhood or gardening, which most of my patients say they do. You gotta get tired. About 150 minutes, and you have to get short of breath to the extent that you can't finish a sentence. Check with your cardiologist, with your doctor, I don't wanna get in trouble. But that's basically the requirement. You really have to get tired. The second thing is, yes. No, I'm a week. Yeah, yeah, I, w I would have killed a few people here, so, so yes, 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 a week. The second thing is leg strength. Leg strength seems to be associated with brain strength, brain health. So initially when we saw the data, we thought there was a di directionality thing, meaning that the person was healthier, therefore their legs were bigger. No, th it seems to be the other direction as well. People who strengthened their legs actually grew their hippocampi, the part of the brain that's associated with, with memory. And having stronger legs are important for multiple reasons. Because the biggest pump in your body is not your heart. The biggest pump in your body are your legs. What pumps the blood back to your, to your heart and to your brain are the legs. The biggest organ of metabolism are your legs. When you work out your legs, your BDNF, brain-derived growth factor, goes up. So, and most importantly, less falls. What gets people over 65 to the emergency room? Falls. So leg strength is critical. I'm, I don't mean squats and putting weights on your shoulder. Just holding onto a chair and doing mini squats. Not all the way to 45 degrees, but mini squats and strengthen legs. That's, I think, one of the best things you can do. Third part of exercise is move throughout the day. So studies show that people who did 30 minutes of exercise, yet they sat dormant for eight hours because of job, pretty much negated the benefits of the exercise. So move throughout the day. Get up, move around. One of the things I said, if I was Secretary of Health and Human Services, if you have any poll, I would, I would do something that would get me fired the next day. I would connect every TV to a recumbent bike. So it's not working unless they're moving. Imagine that. 
you would change healthcare overnight. So those are the three things. Keep moving, leg extra strength, and aerobic exercise, critical. Stress, stress is central to this program because stress is not just stress. There's good stress and bad stress. In fact, good stress is the biggest protector of the brain by far. So let's define those. Good stress is the kind of stress that's driven by your purpose, has a direction, has clear goals of achievement, and that is basically driven by you. That's good stress. Bad stress is the type that's not driven by you. It's the opposite of that and has no direction, no clear outcomes, and it actually destroys the brain. People with chronic stress have repeatedly been shown to have smaller hippocampi, smaller brains. So what's the difference? Where does this take place? It takes place in your, hip, in your limbic system, the emotional brain, and the frontal lobe. What does that mean? Those regions define an activity as good or bad. Not necessarily in short term, over time, you know. And one of the biggest protectors of brain function was job complexity. That's a stressful thing. So you have a higher job complexity, it's stressful. But it was driven by a purpose and it has direction. So the hippocampus defines what it is. This is a general theory and it makes sense. And then it sends a message to your hypothalamus. I like it or I don't like it. Let's just call it that. And hippocampus sends a different message to a hypothalamus, to a pituitary. And what does pituitary do? Everything. Growth hormone, insulin, thyroid, immune system, everything is controlled by the pituitary. So good stress, your oxytocin goes up, cortisol goes down, adrenaline goes down, the other hormones are modulated and controlled. Bad stress, complete opposite. Adrenaline goes up, cortisol goes up, Oxytocin goes down, and your thyroid especially, but even your insulin level and immune system is affected. People under chronic stress develop shingles. People under chronic stress have more infections. Even your immune system affected by this pathway. So what's the clue? What's, what, what to do? Define your stresses clearly. If Aisha and I ever get you know, a, a deal from a company, it's gonna be a whiteboard company. It's not going to make much money, but it's a whiteboard company. Because we have a whiteboard, where is Sophie, in every room. And the importance of that is to write down your, what are the stressors in your life clearly. We talk about SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, time-bound. Not broad, I want to you know, be healthy. That doesn't mean anything. Specifically. And write down the good stresses and bad stresses. And your job is to increase the good stresses because it's a zero-sum element. If you increase the good stresses, it pushes away the bad stresses. And, and if you don't, nothing affects all of the other systems more than stress. Nutrition, it's not gonna happen. Exercise, it's never gonna happen. Sleep, everybody's gonna have trouble with that. And mental activities, are. so stress management is critical. And, and defining it and managing is, is the first thing. Um, the other thing about stress is um, that um, some meditation, prayer, all of those things are critical because it gives you a period of connecting to the self. So I, we really uh, want people to kind of focus on that as well. By the way, um, there is no such thing as multitasking. There's only doing multiple things badly. <laughs> and, and when you do that, it creates a background discomfort, background anxiety that actually then start affecting the whole system. Sleep, I can just stop at this picture. Yeah, sleep is critical, eight hours a day. So here, start with that. What's the optimal hours of sleep? Seven to eight. People who slept less were sicker, people who slept more were sicker. Why? Seven to eight hours is all you need to do what the brain needs to do during sleep but you need deep restorative sleep where you go through REM and non-REM sleep. REM is eye movements, but, but it has to do with dreaming. And the rest of the non-REM, the four phases, have to do with brain cleansing and processing. So the two functions of, the, of sleep are <clears throat> memory consolidation and cleansing. And it does more of its cleansing at night than any other time. 
and one night's bad sleep results in increased amyloid, increased um, uh, uh, inflammatory markers, and we have shown that even microglia, which are called the janitor cells, go awry, meaning that instead of doing what they're supposed to do, which is get rid of the waste, they start actually eating away from good brain. So that's why people with chronic sleep disorders have smaller brains. Now, you can't make up, I have people yawning already. I'm really good at sleep. <laughs> so, so you can't make up for sleep deprivation in the weekend. But what is important is that there, almost everybody can develop better sleep pattern or better sleep architecture over six months to a year. Now, although we're not against medicine, but never medicine long term. There's, the flaw in medicine is that we have all begun to believe that once you're put on a medicine, it's for life. It's not supposed to be like that. Blood pressure medicine is needed, but short term, because immediately lifetime, lifestyle is not gonna take, take over. But uh, you know, if your blood pressure is 170, if you don't treat it with blood pressure medicine, you're gonna have vascular disease. <clears throat> but lifestyle takes time. Same thing with sleep medications. Majority of sleep medications affect how deep a sleep you get. You don't get restorative sleep. So what is the solution for sleep problems? Fourfold, well, twofold, sleep hygiene and cognitive behavioral therapy. Sleep hygiene means uh, environment, behavior, and food. What environment is light, get rid of light, darken your room, if you have to wake up in the middle of the night, don't turn on all the light, have a, you know, a, a lower level light. Second of all, uh, temperature, cooler than, you, you know, than your body temperature. Thirdly, sound, get rid of sound as much as possible or use um, an, uh, white noise. Behavior, create a pattern of sleep. Go to bed same time, wake up the same time. Don't, you've heard this many times, don't have play on the phone. Don't get on the computer because that light actually turns on your circadian clock. And, and, if you, and, and thirdly, foods, there's much more to this, but I'm, I'm just skimming over this. Foods, if, when you were younger, you could eat a whole huge meal five minutes before sleep and you would be out, right? Doesn't happen like that anymore. Two hours before sleep, eating, and not closer than that, because it's not that the sound, the borborygmy, as it's called in medicine, is keeping you awake. The high energy foods are working through your system and that's keeping the system up. So, and, and those high energy foods again are fats and sugars. So that those are the uh, environmental behavior. And cognitive behavioral therapy has to do with these running thoughts in your head. So what do you do with that? That didn't happen overnight. That was a lifetime of just associating thinking and worrying with bed. That has to be disassociated, decoupled. How do you do that? Every time you have a thought, get up, put a have a chair next to bed, write your thoughts down in bullet form and on notepad and park it. That's not gonna get rid of that behavior overnight. It's gonna take weeks and months. But after a while, it's gonna be a decoupling of bed and thought. And that's critical. For, for some people, that's, that's the problem. So that's it. And then the last one, sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, you suspect sleep apnea. If your partner is snoring, holding their breath, or they're having nine hours sleep and they're still tired during the day, check yourself for sleep apnea because sleep apnea increases your chance of Alzheimer's by 70% and get that evaluated. <clears throat> Optimize. Optimize means challenging the brain. We did the largest meta-analysis last year was published that looked at multiple studies um, and then we uh, collated the data. And, and what we found was that Oh, let's, let's get back to the studies, two, two cute studies. Lots of other studies, the taxi driver study. How many people know about the taxi driver study here? So <laughs> we have a good student up front. <laughs> so many years ago, before there was GPS, they did a study between taxi drivers and bus drivers <clears throat> in London. If anybody's been into London, it's not Chicago. It's not Rush Street, Clark Street, everything is line. It's all over the place. And if you needed to get a license for driving a taxi, you had to know every street, every household. So, but, but bus drivers, same route, so no, no thought. They did cognitive testing as well as imaging of their brains before the study period and then after the study period. And what they found was the bus drivers, no change in their brain. 
The taxi drivers, they're not these 20-year-old, 30-year-olds. They're in their 50s on the average. Their brain actually grew, specifically their hippocampus, grew in size, and their cognitive testing actually improved. So challenging task actually grows your brain. And then we have the Nun study. I love this study because it actually was a paradigm shift. Large group of nuns dedicated their time, their, their blood, their imaging, and their brain after death to study at Rush University and multiple other universities. And a group of them that died had their brain examined, actually all of them did, but this group had inundated, was inundated with pathology. Vascular disease, smaller brain, amyloid, you know, this person, these people should have had dementia. Yet, right before death, they were normal. Another group that was not as disease, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 affected, vascular or otherwise, and they were fairly normal brains, but they had Alzheimer's and dementia right before death, dementia in particular. So what was the difference? Why wouldn't a diseased brain manifest in dementia? And this one, the man, what do you think was the difference? It wasn't the blood levels. You know what it was? No. No, their writings. The writings of the, the group that, that had better cognitive function in spite of brain damage, disease, their, their vocabulary was much more complex. Their sentences were much more complex. They were actually much more socially active. The, the concept of idea density was much more. I love that idea density. I was telling the group this morning, if I ever develop a band, it's going to be called idea density. <laughs> but the other group that had normal brains, that manifested dementia, had lower density, lower idea density, simpler vocabulary, and much less complex conversation and thought and social activity. That's how important cognitive activity and social activity is for brain health. And this has been repeated in many other studies as well. So at the end of our meta-analysis, the, the main factors are complexity, challenge, and purpose. Complexity means tasks that involve all of the brain, not Sudoku, not following a little dot on a computer, Lumosity or otherwise. It is things like playing get a musical instrument, learning new songs, learning new language, learning, uh, managing a group, uh, volunteering, playing cards with, with friends, you know, conversations with friends. Why? I, you'll hear Sophie sing, and she's an amazing singer, and her mom is too. I'm, I'm the least talented of the family. Sorry, you got me. I play guitar, and I'm the worst guitar player humanity's ever known. I'm, I've been playing one song for 30 years, same chords. <laughs> But it's, for me, it's brain building. For everybody else, it's actually destroying their brain. But let's take playing guitar. So when you're reading the notes, your language centers, your Broca's and Wernicke's is actually being stimulated. Left, for majority, it's the left bridle. You're processing it visually. It's your occipital lobe. You're processing it as far as its context. It's your frontal lobe. You're being creative. It's your right parietal lobe. You're emotionally involved. It's your limbic system. That's the entire brain. That's a brain on fire. That's no Sudoku. That's why complex behaviors affect the brains exponentially. So I always say, don't retire, rewire. The group that had the greatest decline in cognition, out of all these things that we talked about, you know who it was? People who were highly functioning, and then they retired, and they didn't do anything for two to three years. Steep drop. Why? The number one thing for a brain is information. More than glucose, the brain thrives information because of its survival, right? It needed survival, it needs information. And especially if you've given it information, so it's made throughout life, you are active, it's made those connections, so you're protected. And then you don't do anything for three years. There's what's called Wallerian degeneration. There's a pullback of those connections and rapid dementia. So keep your brain active. It doesn't mean you have to do the same thing you were doing before. In fact, find things you love. Take courses in college. You know, whatever it is that challenges your brain. Now, the, the key is it has to be complex. It can't be repetitive. You know, people say, I, I crochet. <clears throat> I don't know much about crocheting, but I, I, if it's the same pattern, it's not challenging. So the next thing is challenge. If you're playing a musical piece that has four chords, 
Only you know what's the next step. It's five chords. If you're learning a language and you know 20 words, that's, I, that's how I stopped in French, <laughs> then it's 25 words. If you are managing a group, it's the next thing. So push your brain around your purpose. It should be something that is driven by your purpose that actually that keeps you moving forward. So this trifecta, I think, is the most important thing for brain health. Now, the key is you can't do one of them alone. You have to do all. Whereas we don't sell anything, like a lot of people, vitamin concoctions and protocols or this or that. Everything we talk about is free. Food, air, sleep, walk, and keep your mind active with your community. But we do say that it's not a simple pill. It's a combination. You can start with one thing, and you should start with one thing. If it's exercise, and if you've never exercised, start a brisk walk. And it should be only five minutes, because our focus is on habit, not on the outcome. Because if you build a habit, the outcome will follow. If it's food, if you are a carnivore, start with one thing, fish. Or uh, no, actually, not, let's go the other way around. Red meat. And quantify it and reduce it by half for the next six weeks. Because once you create that success pattern, then that's going to motivate the rest. Now remember, when it comes to food, you're going to have difficulty at first. Not because of the food. All these people who go vegan or plant-based say, oh, I had such a difficult time. Well, that's because you're changing behavior. Change is always hard in body. And you're changing taste. All of that takes habit and time. And then after three months, especially sugar, <clears throat> everybody that stopped sugar comes to us and says, this is terrible. I'm feeling I have low energy. There's something going on. Am I having... No, I said, keep it up. And then after three months, they say, oh, a fog is lifted. Because that, that is withdrawal. withdrawal, withdrawal from sugar. So give it time, one step at a time, and, and make success. And, and I say, if we do all of this, even if you do it nominally, you reduce your chance of dementia significantly. But more importantly, you keep your cognitive function for well into your 80s, 90s, and beyond. So we are doing the study here at Beach Cities, the only study of its type in the country. Um, uh, 1,700 individuals for three years. Uh, if anybody's interested, they can contact Beach Cities Health District. And, we w and then from this, actually, we want to make Beach Cities, health Beach Cities the healthiest district in the, in, in the country. So, um...